Good morning, good morning, Rabotai. Welcome to Breakfast in the Class. Breakfast in the Class today is dedicated in honor of Isaac, Jennifer, and Joyce Sitt for teaching me valuable lessons I will never forget by Nathan Hoffman. Hazaku Baruch, both to Nathan and to the Sitts for those beautiful lessons. As well, <coughs> uh, dedicated for complete for Ashlema, for Chana Batsema Fega, and uh, Eliyahu Shimon Memazah for Tunei, and as well, for the week of Kobu, sponsored by David E. Ash in honor of you and your substantial capacity to today and every day. Please only answer Amen if you're hearing this Beracha live. Baruch Atal Dunai. Elohim Melacha Adam Shakol Niabaro. Okay, let's begin. My friends, there's something that I just wanted to draw your attention to, which I thought was a beautiful concept, a beautiful idea, but has ma- uh, multiple ramifications with regards to its application. So let's begin. I want to start with the words of Harambam in Hilchot Teshuvah. Rambam says, Lefikach, tzarich kol adam, a person must shir et atzmo, kol ashana kulai, must see himself the entire year. Ki'ilu chetziav zakai, vechetziav hayav. He's got 50% mitzvot, 50% averot. High game, bottom of the ninth. Two outs, three balls, two strikes. Base is loaded. If he does one sin, he has uh, signed the warrant, if you will, for himself, for for negative, to to be guilty, because he is 51% now. Vigaram lo ashchata, he caused his own destruction. Asa mitzvah achat, if he does one mitzvah, hare yechri et atzmo vet kol haulam kulo lekav zechut. He merited to turn himself, and indeed the Rambam is also brings a wider picture of that, lekav zechut. Vigaram lo lelahem tishua v'atzala, and he caused for them salvation and to be saved. Rambam says, quoting the Gemara, that not only is a person supposed to see themselves as 50-50, with one mitzvah able to tip the scales, or one avera able to tip the scales in the other way, bar minan, he should also see the whole world as 50-50. So if he does one mitzvah, not only does he 51% himself, but that one mitzvah could 51% the whole world. And when you think that way, a person is suddenly given such juice, such energy and excitement to his mitzvot, and such care and concern with regards to his Averot because Shema Yisrael. Let me give you an example. Imagine there's a time where a person experiences a financial penalty, a huge financial penalty from, industry, from the, uh, the, uh, the tax, from the tax man or whatever if they're classified as a certain kind of business. If they make over this amount of money, then what happens? Then they're classified as a certain kind of business, and then they get fines for certain things. That business will do anything in the world to make sure that they don't make that extra dollar. Why? Because it might just be one dollar, but that one dollar changes the entire classification. So too is the status of tzaddik and rasha. So too is the status of chaim and mita. The difference can be one sin or one mitzvah. And when a person does that, then what do they, what do they do? They act in the most beautiful of ways. They're completely zoned in to be able to always do the right thing. But my friends, this idea that one mitzvah could change everything, our rabbis tell us, that there are certain mitzvot that do extra in order to be able to tip the scales. And which mitzvot are those? I want to share with you an idea that they say over in the name of the Koch Ve'or. Rav Blazer, he says as follows. We know that if a person on Rosh Hashanah is a tzaddik, he's written in the book of life. A rasha written in the book of Bar Menan, the opposite. Benonim, someone who's a He's got equal amounts. He's a Benoni, middle of the road guy. 
This guy does not get judged on Rosh Hashanah, but rather his judgment is, is hanging and waiting for Yom Kippur. And the expression of Chazal is, if he did Teshuvah, then he gets written in the Book of Life. If he did not do Teshuvah, then unfortunately, the opposite. Asks the Sefer Kochave Or a, f- a fascinating question. He says, I don't understand. This guy's a 50-50 guy, right? That's why he didn't get judgment on Rosh Hashanah. Why is it telling us that if he did Teshuvah, he gets written in the Book of Life? If he does any mitzvah, he just tipped his classification. So why is the Torah, why is our Chachamim proscribing which mitzvah he needs to do in order to get rid of the book of life for Yom Kippur? Good question. I could do Shiluah HaKen. I could eat, uh, I could make Bekat HaMazon. I could give Tzedakah to someone. I could do anything. Listen carefully, my friends. Says Rav Blazer as follows. He says, you know, there's times when a person hurts someone deeply that they love. Now, you hurt this person, you said something incredibly disrespectful, you, you, you called them a name, you got angry, you lost your temper, and, and you said something you can't, really, you can't really dial back. I want you to imagine the next morning, you come and you buy them a nice little gift. And you walk in and you hand him the gift. Does the person want to take that gift from you? No. What do they tell you? You can keep your gift. What do they really want? And what do they really need? An apology. Time. First you need to fix this. Then you can do mitzvot. If a person came to Rosh Hashanah and they got into a situation where they are 50-50 and they did not make it across good, the the good finish line. So Borei Olam is now waiting for this person to fix their deeds. At this point, doing another mitzvah doesn't solve the problem. It's like trying to buy a gift when you really owe an apology. Teshuvah is that apology. Says Rav Blazer, since this time is so specially, uniquely suited for Teshuvah, a person who does not do Teshuvah in this time, it's such a blatant disregard of your responsibilities, that even if you did more mitzvot, it would not be enough. And what that means to me, Rabotai, is that there are certain mitzvot that come in their right time, in the right way, and they demand something from us. And let me explain what I mean by that. <coughs> Sefer Matok Aor brings a fascinating story with the, uh, with the Admor Migur. In the city of Gur, there was a man who was a real estate landlord. He owned uh, an apartment or a house. One day, he's looking over his books and he sees that not only has this woman who was living in the, in the apartment not paid her bill this month for rent, she didn't pay the month before, or the month before, the month before, the month before, the month before. Six months, she hasn't paid rent. He knows, unfortunately, this woman, her husband died. She's an almana. She's a single mother living by herself, a widower. He feels terrible. But how long can he wait? He goes to this woman. He says, listen, I know your situation. I know how hard it must be. But listen, this apartment for me, this is my business. I, I get my income from this apartment. And I know that your situation is so difficult. But what can I do? You know, eventually, six months I didn't say anything. But eventually, I have to be able to get some rent for this apartment. The woman, she's pleading. The guy says, listen, I don't know what you want. How much nicer could I be? The woman goes to the rabbi, the rabbi of the town who was at the time was the the Imre Emet. And she tells the rabbi what she's going through. And I can't believe it. And this guy's throwing me out on the street. The guy calls his Talmud in. He says, what's this I hear about you taking an almana and throwing her on the street? And the guy says, rabbi, I didn't throw an almana on the street. I have an apartment. I'm supposed to rent it. She hadn't paid at rent. I understand the situation. I gave her for one month, two months, three months, four months. How long am I supposed to go? The rabbi said, how long are you supposed to go? You're not supposed to throw her at it ever. And listen what the man said. Because this conversation, to me, was so 
insightful. He said to the rabbi, why am I the only one that has to take the full burden? I understand that we need to support a widower. I get it. It makes sense to me. But why am I the... Because she lives in my apartment. I have to carry it by myself. You want to tell me that the community is going to pay me instead? Fine. You want to tell me I need to take a little bit of a loss? Fine. You want to tell me I need to wait an extra month? Fine. But I should sit here renting my apartment to this person. She'll never pay rent. And I have to leave her there because she's an almana. And that's my problem. The almana is only my problem. The rabbi said, yes, and I can prove it to you. There's a very interesting halakha. I'll give you just the background of the halakha for one second. A person who has an Evid Kanani is a, a servant, and that servant is not Jewish. The halakha is that if he's a Jewish servant, so he's already Jewish. He has mitzvot. But a non-Jewish servant, who's a servant of a Jewish person, Evid, the halakha is he's obligated in mitzvot ki isha. He has a smaller amount of mitzvot, but he's already part of the Jewish family. Fascinating halakha. So could you imagine this guy is not Jewish, he's your worker, suddenly he has to keep the mitzvot, he has to keep Shabbat. Right? He's an Kirani. He has to keep the mitzvot of... So he has this quasi-state of half of a, like, so to speak, half Jewish. Listen to this, my friends. What happens if this guy has two owners? They own a partnership. He works for both of them. One of them says, for whatever reason, here, I'm freeing you, here's your own, you have your rights of a document, I'm giving up my point. Now, he's half free. Chetziav ben Chorim, Chetziav Eved. He's half a free man, half of a servant, okay? Says the Gemara something fascinating. If he's Jewish, he can marry someone who's Jewish. But if he's half an Eved, the part of him that's an Eved is not allowed to marry someone Jewish. Who is an Eved allowed to marry? Only another Eved. But the other part of him that's now half free, which is that means he's half Jewish, he can't marry an Eved. So this man is stuck. He can't get married. He can't have a family. He can't have children. Says the Gemara, what do we do? We go to the other owner. Kofin Oto, we force him to write the man a freedom, a document of freedom. We force him to release this person because the guy's stuck. He can't, he, has, he can't fulfill the mitzvah of having children. He has to free the man. But because there's a debt here, the man himself, the Eved, writes uh, whatever the amount that it costs, he writes that as a contract. I owe you the money that you paid, so to speak, or that I, that I charged you to be able to, to take me in. Okay? That's the Gemara says. Asks the rabbi, he says to this man, he says, this guy has a problem. He's half Eved, half Ben Chorin. Why is this my problem? Why is it not the community's problem? He's going to write me a document that he owes me the money, but who says he's ever going to pay it? I don't know if he's going to pay it or not. Why is it my problem? The answer is, said the rabbi, listen carefully, guys. A mitzvah that comes to you, it came to you on purpose. If it knocked at your door, not at someone else's door, not at everyone's door, it came to you. HaKadosh Baruch Hu sent you that mitzvah and you have to take responsibility. It's true, if the almana lived in someone else's apartment, it would be their problem. But she doesn't. She lives in yours. You have to figure this out. And I don't know how you want to figure this out. By the way, if you want, you could go to the community and say there's an almana who needs her rent paid. They'll pay you the rent and you'll take the rent for yourself because she owes it to you. That's completely legit. But to throw her out on the street, a widow with orphans, impossible. And if the mitzvah came to you, it's your mitzvah, it's your responsibility. You know, they say that <clears throat> um, when God gives a person the gift of a child, HaKadosh Baruch Hu handpicks for that child which parents it will have. He gives a specific diamond to specific parents. He gives a specific kid with a specific issue to specific parents. Because that parent is specifically tailored for that job. 
so too when a mitzvah comes your way. My friends, I want to share with you a powerful idea based on this concept, that a mitzvah that comes to you, it was designed and given specifically to you and specifically for you. <clears throat> there was a rabbi whose name was Rabbi Shimshon Dinin, rabbi in, in Yerushalayim. Anyway, one day, one of the people who was one of his students, this rabbi, came to the rabbi, Rabbi, I'm in desperate need of a loan. Uh, everything's falling apart. I need help. I have a guy who will lend me the money, but he won't lend me the money unless, you know, someone will vouch for me. The rabbi says, no problem, I'll call. He calls the fellow and he says, listen, I know this man, he's an honest man, he's a good man, he has a, he has a family, he works very hard at his business, he's a good guy. Give him the, lend him the money. The guy says, okay, lends him the money. Year goes by. Guy comes back to the rabbi, he says, listen, rabbi, I know that you did not sign on the loan as a guarantor. You didn't take a PG, a personal guarantee, on this loan. But I'll tell you the truth. The only reason why I lent him the money is because you told me he was a good guy and you told me he's going to pay me back. He hasn't paid me back. I, I think that's on you. The rabbi says, on me? I was vouching for his character. He's a good guy. And he probably still is working hard. But not every guy who works hard makes parnasah. It's talui and mazal. Siata deshmaya. You have to have good mazal. You have to have help from heaven. I wasn't telling you anything more than that. The rabbi says, but let me ask. He goes to Rav Aaron Leib Steinman, one of the greats of the generation. And he asks him this question. He says, listen, I didn't sign anything. I would not have signed anything. The rabbi says, listen. You're saying... What you're saying is true. And in terms of halachic obligations, you have no halachic obligations. But this was a case where someone came to you specifically and they asked you specifically about the loan. And you gave them those reassurances, almost telling him that I'm backing this loan. If you thought, if you felt that the guy was not going to pay back, you maybe should have said, listen, he's a great guy. I don't know if he's going to be able to pay you back. But you didn't give him that warning. So even if you're not responsible halachically or legally, Maybe this is a mitzvah that came to you. And maybe there's a mitzvah that you should take on yourself. And he says that I understand that it's a lot of money and that you're a rabbi and you don't have a lot of money. He says, go to this man and tell him, listen, if the guy ever pays you the money back, fine, you'll give it back to me. But I'm taking on myself to pay back the loan. I just can't afford to pay back the loan. So I'm going to pay small installments every month out of my paycheck as a rabbi till the loan is covered. The guy says, okay, I don't really have a choice. Fine, let's do it. They divide up this loan. It took the rabbi, I think it was four, three years, four years, five years to be able to pay off this loan. My friends, the month the rabbi made the last payment, that was a day, that was the month that he passed away. Rabbi Aaron Leib told him, you should pay this, you should do this, and you should have this mitzvah because it came your way. You see, you're looking oftentimes at the mitzvah and thinking, I have my life, I have myself, do I choose to engage in this mitzvah? But actually, oftentimes, it is the mitzvah that gives you the situation that you're in. They give a funny story, an example of this concept. You have a guy who's a farmer, he lives off by himself out in the, in the boondocks. One day he has to mail a package. For the first time in his life, he goes into the big city. He comes into the big city, he's got this box, and he's sending someone some products from his farm across the country. Walks in, big box, he's got 25 cent stamp on it. Anyway, the lady thinks, looks at him, she says, you Majnun, you can't put a 25 cent stamp on a box like this. He goes, why not? She, say, she tells him, the box is very heavy. You know, it's almost 50 kilo, this box. A box like this, you need probably 100 stamps. The guy says, lady, I've never done this before, but that's ridiculous. You're telling me the package is too heavy and you want me to add stamps? You want me to add weight to the package? <laughs> Obviously the guy is a moron. Because the added weight, it is added weight, you gotta carry a little bit more, but it is that added weight that gets the package to where it's supposed to go. You have people who when things are a little bit tough, the first thing they cut is all that tzedakot. 
But really, the tzedakah was giving you, was making the package, the rest of the package work. And it's not an extra burden, it's what's protecting the assets from dripping, 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 dripping between a person's fingers and losing them. During the time of Aseret Yimei Teshuvah, a person needs to be thinking to themselves, not only with regards to the money. A person thinks to themselves, I don't have time. So what am I going to cut now? I don't have, Rabbi, I would love to come to the class. I don't have time. You know why? Work is so hard that I don't have time for the class. The, the class is the stamps. The tzedakah is the stamps. If you put the stamps on the darn package, you wouldn't need to be working this hard. If we believe, if we believe in one of the basic tenets of Judaism, is that God rewards our goodness and our good deeds, with good mazah, with parnasah, with beracha, then obviously, taking the stamps off the package to make it lighter, is not getting your package where it needs to go uh, in, in the right way. Hashem should bless us to have the right perspective, to understand that during these days, we have a tremendous opportunity, specifically in the area of teshuvah, specifically in the area of tefillah, of prayer, and specifically in the area of tzedakah. As the Gemara tells us, Utshuva, utfila, utsedaka, ma'avirin et roa hagezera, that takes away the bitterness from the decree. There's a lot of mitzvot that you could do to even the scale. But God gave us these three mitzvot specifically for this time to be able to do and to be able to tilt the scales, to be able to get our package where it needs to go, to be able to have life and beautiful things and berachot for our families. And Be'ezrat Hashem, when He sees us engaging in this way, He will write us in the book of all of the berachot. Amen.